Recall that if A is any non-empty set and S sub A is the set of permutations of A, then the set S sub A forms a group under permutation multiplication. So now I want to ask, what if A is the set 1, 2, 3, all the way up to N? So it's a finite set. Well, if A is the finite set, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to N, then the group S sub N consisting of all the permutations of A under permutation multiplication is called the symmetric group of degree N. The order of a group G, which we denote with what looks like little absolute value bars, is the number of elements in the group. So I want to point out that we said that S sub N was the symmetric group of degree N, but that doesn't mean that the order of S sub N is N. So what is the order of S sub N? Well, let's think about this. Suppose we have uh, an example here of an element that might be in S sub N, so I'll call it phi. So what would phi look like? So phi would be some uh, permutation and would have elements 1, 2, 3, and then all the way up to, well, we'd have n minus 1 and then eventually n. And so what would happen to 1? Well, that would be phi of 1. It would take 1 to whatever phi of 1 is. 2 would go to phi of 2. 3 would go to phi of 3, and so on. So you can see how this works. So this is just some notation here. So let's use this idea to try and figure out what the order of s sub n would be. And let's look at the first option here, phi of 1. Where could we take 1? How many options, how many choices do we have for phi of 1? Well, if there's n things here, we could have n choices. We could have phi of 1 be 1, or phi of 1 be 2, or phi of 1 be 3, all the way up to n. So we would have n choices for phi of 1. Now, if we've made a choice for phi of 1, then we have n minus 1 choices left for phi of 2. So I'll multiply that here, so n minus 1. And then how about for phi of 3? Well, I already used up two of the choices here, so I would have n minus 2. And you can keep going with this idea here until you get to phi of n minus 1. And by that point, well, there's only two choices left for phi of n minus 1. And then finally 5n, there's only one choice left. And so this represents the order of the symmetric group S sub n. And you might recognize this. This is just n factorial. And I think we saw this before, and it kind of makes sense. If you think about a group of three elements, for example, 1, 2, and 3, there would be three factorial or six different ways of arranging them, and we've seen this before. Um, so in general, the degree of the symmetric group S sub n is n, but the order of the symmetric group S sub n is n factorial. So you might recall that we had the group S sub 3, which was the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. And it had these elements, uh, row naught, which was the identity, and then row 1, which was a rotation, row 2, which was another rotation, and then the mu's, mu1, mu2, mu3, which were flips. So here are the elements. And if we look at these, we see that, um, so the identity just leaves everything alone. Row 1 kind of rotates everything once around. Row 2 rotates, its, rotates everything again once around. Uh, mu1 leaves 1 alone and, and flips uh, 2 and 3. So it kind of flips across the axis running uh, through uh, bisecting that angle at 1 there. And then similarly for mu2 and mu3. So uh, the notation here, S sub 3, suggests that maybe this might be a symmetric group. And if we think about 1, 2, and 3 as being the elements in that uh, set that we talked about earlier, then you can see how we might have permutations of this set. So here are the elements written out again, and for each one of these elements that we uh, earlier had identified as a symmetry of an equilateral triangle, let's try and write it in permutation notation. Okay, so the first one was the identity. So for the identity, that would be row naught, we will write it as, well, we have one, two, and three, and the identity would leave everything alone. So that kind of makes sense. 
How about row one? That was the rotation. So we start with the one, two, and three up top, and now we ask, okay, what happened to each of these things? So where did one go? Well, one went to where two was. You see now it's where the two was before. So one went to where two was, two went to where three was, and three went to where one was. Row two, that's another rotation. So I have one, two, and three. And now I think you can see that one went to where three was. See, there's the one up there. So one went to where three was, two went to where one was, and three went to where two was. For mu one, this was a flip, and the flip left one alone. If you look at the triangles here, one stayed exactly where it was, so I can just put a one here, and it was the two and the three that flipped. So th two went to three, and three went to two. Uh, for mu two, that's the one that left two all alone. So two stayed where it was, one went to three, and three went to one. And then finally, mu sub three was the one that left three all alone. And so three stayed where it was, and one and two switched places. Okay, let's let, look at it an example calculation. We saw before that row one times mu two equaled mu one. Uh, and so I explored this in an earlier video. You can actually see uh, how this works out with the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. Just to kind of quickly recap, here are the three uh, things we're talking about here. And remember how this works with function composition, because that's really what this is. We actually go in reverse order. So when I have uh, row one mu two, you actually apply mu two first. So mu two says uh, take one and move it uh, up here, take three, move it down here, and take two and leave it exactly where it is and then apply row one to that. And if you watch the earlier video, I work through this uh, in terms of this notation, but in this video, I wanna look at permutation notation. So underneath each of these, I'm gonna write the equivalent uh, permutation notation and then apply the permutation multiplication to see if we do get the right answer. Okay, so row one, that we before we said was, if I take the one, two, three here, Row one was the one that sent one to two, two to three, and three to one. Mu two was the thing that left two alone and swapped one and three. And we need to check and make sure that we get mu one when we do this. So let's write these out and I'll write them next to each other so we can apply the permutation multiplication. And so remember again, you work in reverse order. So Let's write out what we think we should get here. Okay, so one goes to three, and three goes to one. That means one stayed where it was. Two stayed at two, but then two was brought to three. So two goes to three. Three was brought to one. One was brought to two. So overall, three was brought to two. And if we look at this, yep, this is the thing that leaves one alone. That is mu one. So this does indeed work. So now maybe uh, you might be asking, if S3 represents the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, does S4 represent the symmetries of a square? Well, remember the symmetries of a square we represented with D4. And so we have our rotations, rows, we have mu's, and then we also had our deltas. And so here they are, uh, here they are uh, listed out. The rows make sense. You're just kind of rotating everything around. The mu1 is a flip, and if you look at it, it's a flip across a uh, axis down the middle. So it kind of is like a uh, vertical axis uh, dividing the square in half, and so it flips everything over to the other side. And the mu2 is the axis that divides the square in half uh, through the center horizontally and flips everything. And the deltas were the ones that flipped across the diagonal. If you notice the four and two stay where they are, but the one and three swap places for delta one. And for delta two, it's kind of the opposite way, where the one and three stay where they are and the two, two and the four uh, swap places. So D4 has eight elements, but what about S4? S4, remember how this works, the order is four factorial or 24. So already we see, no, these, uh, this can't be right. 
the symmetries of a square, well, there's only eight of them, and S4 has 24 elements. But we can say that D4, in a sense, is a subgroup of S4. Now remember that D4 is uh, really referring to the symmetries on a square, and S4 is referring to permutations of the set 1, 2, 3, 4, so we have to be a little bit careful because it's not uh, quite uh, accurate to say it's a subgroup. I'm cheating a little bit because there are different ways of thinking about them, but if we think of the elements of D4 as permutations on the set 1, 2, 3, and 4, then we see that D4 can be thought of as a subgroup of S4. Uh, remember, that's when we think of it in that way. And remember the notation, we, uh, when we say something is a subgroup of something else, we use what looks like a greater than or a less than sign, in this case, uh, less than, since D4 is a subgroup of S4 when you think of D4 as permutations on the set 1, 2, 3, and 4.